Consider now Enceladus, Saturn's icy moon, one of the most promising places to look for life outside Earth. Scientists have just detected the last one of the six necessary ingredients for its formation, phosphorus. This rarest element has been discovered in an ocean on Enceladus. This rare element helps make the soil fertile on Earth. But the concentration of this mineral in the hidden seas on the distant moon might be from 100 to 1,000 times greater than in the oceans of our home planet. It might be because Enceladus' ocean is rich in carbonates, just like soda water, and this soda water is likely to dissolve the phosphates in the moon's rocks. The new discovery also suggests that on other icy moons of Saturn, like Titan, the waters may be loaded with phosphorus too. Why are scientists so excited about this mineral? Well, phosphates, which are compounds that contain phosphorus, are crucial components of life on Earth. DNA, RNA, and cell membranes contain them. But among those six elements required for life, which are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, phosphorus is the least common. In 2004, the Cassini space probe entered the dust from the second outermost ring of Saturn, called the E-ring. It's made up of ice grains and Cetalus ejects. And while studying these ice grains examined by Cassini's cosmic dust analyzer, researchers have detected phosphorus. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's not really large, only 314 miles across. This makes the space body small enough to fit inside Arizona. Hmm, we should try that sometime. Interestingly, when the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, astronomers thought that Enceladus was going to be a frozen ball of ice. But then, surprise, surprise, they spotted plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the moon's surface. It became clear that there was a global ocean between the moon's rocky core and its icy shell. The same researchers previously discovered that Saturn's moon might be home to complex organic molecules, too. Before, scientists thought phosphates could be trapped within the rocky cores of Enceladus and similar worlds. That's why the newest works, which hint that phosphates might also be abundant in the ocean, came as a surprise. Researchers examined 305 ice grains from Saturn's E-ring and found out that 9 of them contained phosphates. And these results were clear and unmistakable. And it's very important because some time ago, phosphine, a compound of hydrogen and phosphorus, was believed to exist in the clouds of Venus. But no one has managed to find any evidence to support this theory. On Enceladus, there's no controversy, and phosphates do exist there. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking mission to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, as we are, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Then we've got Titan, Saturn's largest moon. It's smaller and has lighter gravity than Earth, but it still reminds us of our planet. Like on Earth, nitrogen dominates its atmosphere. Titan is the only other world in our solar system with lakes and rivers. These water bodies are made of hydrocarbons, methane, and ethane. There's also a subsurface ocean of water, but it's located very deep down, and no one has figured out yet if this ocean makes contact with anything under the surface. If it does, it could provide fuel for life after mixing with complex chemistry on the surface. But Enceladus and the other icy moons aren't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, 
a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food and emitting, you know, gas. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the red planet. And it happened 600 times faster than the researchers' model accounted for. The question? What or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that might be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Ooh, that's a long shelf life! This means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the frozen temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, it's deeply frozen. Let it go. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Anyway, if we don't find life outside Earth in our solar system, we could probably look for it on exoplanets, which is what planets outside our star system are called. Some of them look very promising. The closest to Earth exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. It's a mere 4.2 light-years away from Earth. Recently, astronomers have found out that this world might resemble Earth even more than they previously thought. It's just 17% more massive than our home planet. It orbits a star that is dimmer and less massive than the Sun. Proxima Centauri b is in the middle of the star's habitable zone. This means that the chances of liquid water and life might exist on the planet. It looks like the exoplanet is tidally locked with its parent star. One of its sides faces the star at all times, and the other is always in the darkness. Scientists haven't figured out yet whether the planet has an atmosphere, is traveling too close to its star and completes one orbit within 11 Earth days. The radiation from the star might be pulling the planet's air away. If this is the case, Proxima Centauri b isn't likely to have liquid water on its surface. Gliese 832c is 16.2 light-years away from Earth. In the cosmic scheme of things, it's a stone's throw away. This exoplanet is five times as massive as Earth and travels much closer to its parent star. That's why a year on this planet lasts a mere 36 days. But since this star is a red dwarf, much cooler and dimmer than the Sun, Gliese 832c gets as much light and heat as our planet. At the same time, it's still unclear if it's similar to Earth. The planet probably has a much thicker atmosphere that creates a runaway greenhouse effect. This phenomenon occurs when a planet absorbs more heat from its host star than it can release back into space. This means that Gliese 832c is more likely to resemble scorching hot Venus rather than the relatively cool Earth. Hey, I'm cool with that. Now imagine a place where a single day lasts longer than a whole year. On Venus, a day, meaning one full spin on its axis, is as long as 243 Earth days. And what's even weirder, despite the fact that Venus is experiencing a never-ending day, it has a shorter year than Earth. While Earth takes about 365 days to complete one orbit around the Sun, Venus does it in just 225 days. So, somehow, for Venus, a day is more epic than a whole year. Venus is a strange planet in general. It's called Earth's twin because of how alike we are, although it's a bit smaller than Earth. But there are some drastic differences, too. For example, it spins in the opposite direction, which means the sun there rises in the west and sets in the east. And Venus isn't the only one who dances to its own rhythm. Uranus does that too. And finally, Venus is quite crazy in terms of its atmosphere. When you stand on Earth, 
you don't really feel the weight of the air around you. Well, on Venus, that feeling would be like having an elephant sitting on your shoulders. Venus has 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere there is a thick layer of toxic gases. For example, carbon dioxide that's released by all the volcanoes. It presses down with incredible force. This results in very hot temperatures. No wonder it'll take a long time before we'll be able to stand on this planet. Meanwhile, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has an even more speedy orbit than Venus. It completes a full journey around the Sun in just about 88 Earth days. However, it has a slow spin on its axis, which means that one day on Mercury takes about 176 Earth days, basically half a year. Just like with Venus, a day there takes much longer than a year. Since it's closest to the Sun, no wonder Mercury experiences some super-extreme temperature swings. Daytime temperatures can soar up to a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. But wait for the sunset. At night, it drops to freezing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. That's because Mercury doesn't have a thick atmosphere like we do, so the heat doesn't distribute across the planet evenly. If one side is in the dark, it'll be super cold and the other side will be scorching hot, just like if you let a regular big rock lie down under the sun for a while. In fact, it's so cold that there might even be some ice on it. Look at the planet's north polar region, especially those sunlit yellow spots inside craters. These are indications of water ice. Turns out water is much more common in space than we thought. Mars is often dubbed the red planet. It earns this nickname from the abundance of iron oxide, or rust, covering its surface. The iron-rich minerals create a rusty red hue that paints the Martian landscape. But it turns out, Mars isn't just red. If you were standing on Mars, you'd witness desert-like butterscotch terrain with caramel and golden glows, some brown, and even a glimpse of a slight greenish hue. Mars also has the biggest mountain in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons standing at a staggering height of about 13.6 miles tall. It's even taller than Mount Everest. It was formed by the volcanic eruption yielding low-viscosity lava, creating a shield-like structure. Since Mars is covered in sand, it's also famous for its crazy dust storms. But it turns out they're even more insane than we thought. These storms can last for months. While they might present challenges for future human missions, they also contribute to the planet's mesmerizing appearance when observed from afar. And not only storms, but even its own Mars quakes. Also known as seismic tremors, they were first detected by NASA in 2019. Unlike earthquakes that are often triggered by tectonic plate movements, Martian quakes are thought to result from the cooling and contracting of the planet's interior. It's interesting how similar, yet how different the planets are. Saturn's iconic rings might hold a secret link to Earth's ancient past. The rings are composed mainly of ice particles and debris and are estimated to be relatively young in space terms, perhaps just a few hundred million years old. Now, there are some theories that propose that they were born after some catastrophic event. For example, the collision of two large moons or the breakup of a comet. What's interesting is that this timeline coincides with the age of the dinosaur's demise on Earth. Could there be a connection? <laughs> Who knows? By the way, while Saturn takes the crown for its rings, it's not the only planet in our solar system sporting them. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own set of rings, although they might not be as visible and cool as Saturn's. However, there's something where Saturn truly stands out – the magnificent hexagon at its North Pole. It's a colossal six-sided figure. Each side of this incredible structure measures around 9,000 miles long, which is 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. Scientists aren't sure how it was formed or why. They think it might be due to varying wind speeds. Or maybe it's shaped by a localized, slow, meandering jet stream. So far, it remains another of Saturn's mysteries. Much like Saturn's hexagon, Jupiter also has its own weird spot. It's called the Great Red Spot. This is a storm that's been raging for at least 350 years and is larger than Earth itself. Despite its name, the spot's coloration has varied over the years, ranging from brick red to pale salmon. 
Scientists continue to study this enduring storm, unlocking the mysteries of its persistence and ever-changing hues. Meteorologically, the Great Red Spot is a powerhouse. It generates enormous pressure in Jupiter's southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, Jupiter itself is a powerhouse when it comes to magnetic fields. Its magnetic influence is colossal. It extends far beyond the planet itself and creates one of the largest and strongest magnetic fields in our solar system. Because of that, Jupiter is a source of intense radiation and mesmerizing auroras. While Earth's northern lights are breathtaking, Jupiter has something to offer, too. The magnetic field interacts with charged particles from Jupiter's moons and the solar wind. This creates visually striking auroras near its poles. But compared to Earth, the scale of these auroras is incredible, like nothing we've seen on our planet. But even having a cool big spot isn't a unique feature in our solar system. A stormy giant Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from the Sun, also has its great dark spot. Just like Jupiter, it's a massive vortex in Neptune's atmosphere. But unlike its Jupiter counterpart, this spot tends to come and go because of Neptune's dynamic and ever-changing weather patterns. Neptune, together with Uranus, is known as an ice giant. And just like other giants, it boasts some of the most ferocious winds in our solar system. Its supersonic winds can get faster than 2,200 miles per hour. What a drama queen! But this explains its thick cloud formations. By the way, if you ever dreamed of a planet raining diamonds, you might want to visit this planet. Deep within Neptune's atmosphere, where pressures are extreme, scientists theorize that carbon atoms are compressed and form diamonds. And then, these diamonds might be raining down. What a unique touch to stormy weather! Neptune's moons got from their parent with the weird weather. For example, its largest moon, Triton, has a touch of cryovolcanism. Instead of spewing molten rock like Earth's volcanoes, Triton's cryovolcanoes erupt with a mix of water, ammonia, and nitrogen. Picture it as icy geysers shooting material into space. Seems like, in our solar system alone, each planet has its own quirks and interesting qualities. Let's hope that we discover some more interesting things in outer space in the future. You may not have known this, but the Earth once had rings. Usually, Saturn is the planet that comes to mind when we think about rings. However, once upon a time, Earth could have had its own band of dusty particles. It was due to a phenomenon called ring ray, really. Our planet was surrounded by lots of little rocks and dust, perhaps the remnants of a hypothesized ancient planet, Theia. This protoplanet could have existed in the early solar system, and scientists assume that one day it could have collided with the early Earth. In that case, huge remnants of this collision would form our precious moon, and smaller rocks would result in the rings. In any case, the particles were pulled toward Earth's surface by gravity. All this happened around 4.5 billion years ago, shortly after Earth's formation. We know about them thanks to various sources. For example, we found some tiny glass beads in ancient rocks, which might have formed due to intense heat during ring particles' entry into Earth's atmosphere. We also found things like traces of isotopes in ancient rocks. Now, these rings would be much smaller than Saturn's, though, and weren't icy like Saturn's, so they weren't glowing. Our rings were mostly made of rock and dust. Scientists believe that they started around 620 miles above sea level, extending to the Roche limit. They'd be farther away from Earth than our International Space Station and most satellites. From the equator, the rings look like a straight line across the sky. But if you move north or south, they widen, creating a celestial arc. Near the North Pole, they will gain a subtle twilight effect. But unlike Saturn's rings that endure, Earth's were fleeting. Blame the sun! Earth's proximity caused water ice particles, potential ring makers, to turn into gas, leaving no bling behind. Ultraviolet light from the sun stripped away the rest. But what if Earth kept those rings? Imagine seeing this celestial spectacle day and night. Visually, it would be stunning, floating elegantly above our planet. During the day, we'd be adorned with their shimmer, and at night, they would be so bright and mesmerizing that they would even outshine the full moon. However, their impact on our lives wouldn't be that cool. 
First of all, the luminosity reflected off the rings might confuse nocturnal creatures, like dung beetles or swallow-tailed gulls. They're guided by the starlight, so poor creatures would be very confused by all this extra glow. This would disrupt their natural behaviors. The shadow cast by the rings could mess with our weather patterns as well. It would affect sunlight levels and pose a challenge for photosynthesis. Temperatures on the planet would change depending on the thickness and composition of the rings. They would impact our seasons and, potentially, cause even cooler winters and hotter summers. Satellites in Earth orbit might have faced some chaos as well. Space rocks hurtling at them could spell trouble for our high-tech companions. Perhaps things would be better if we kept them initially and evolved with them already existing, adapted to them. But if they suddenly appeared right now, it would cause tons of problems. Well, good thing that only Saturn has rings now. Or maybe not only Saturn. Its glowing bands and the famous Cassini division are visible even through a small telescope or binoculars of an amateur astronomer. They're super old and might have formed back at the times when dinosaurs roamed Earth. But in reality, all four giant planets in our solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune – have them. Their stunning sets of rings are composed of tons of tiny dust particles, a mix of rocks and ice, ranging from tiny bits to sizes as big as a house. It varies from planet to planet, and each of them has its own material makeup. To find out more about this makeup, we can simply look at them. Some particles are as tiny as sand grains, while others are as big as double-decker buses. We also look at how reflective they are and how much they sparkle. Saturn's rings, for example, are mostly water ice, and they look like sparkly frozen droplets. Jupiter's rings, however, are more dusty with fine rocky particles, similar to asteroids. Uranus keeps its ring material a secret, but it's dark and not so sparkly, hinting it's not water ice. Instead, it could be carbon or carbon-containing dust, maybe even charcoal. And Neptune takes it up a notch. Its rings are even darker, suggesting superfine dust, maybe carbon or methane ice. Scientists also study what sort of light these particles emit. They split this light into a spectra and look at the ring's secrets. For example, water ice, iron, and organic tholins are given the rings a reddish tint. And these giants are not the only ones in the universe who have this cool feature. For example, there's a planet way beyond our solar system called J1407b. It has rings 200 times wider than Saturn's, and it looks insane. The planet was called Super Saturn by NASA. On the other end, there's an object with only two tiny rings called 10,199 Car Iclo. If the Super Saturn is most likely a giant with huge gravity, then this thing is very tiny. It's not even a planet. It's the so-called centaur, which is what we call small celestial bodies. In the case of faraway planets, usually we find their rings thanks to radio waves. All planets or satellites send out radio signals. When these signals pass through the rings around them, it results in a weird and pretty crazy symphony. The size and weight of particles in the rings decide the notes. For example, lighter particles, like aluminum, have their own groove, which is different from iron's. Now, the true mystery is how they're formed at all. Each of the planets in our solar system has its own ring history. In Saturn's case, scientists thought that maybe it had some huge moon, and then this moon broke apart for some reason, after a collision, for example, resulting in fascinating rocky bands. But if we sum up all the rocks, they don't result in a big enough object. So that theory most likely isn't true. They might have appeared because of the collision, but between some other objects. Jupiter's faint rings come from dust particles flung into orbit by micrometeorites. Neptune has not really rings, but rather arcs. They're not complete circles around a planet, but just parts of the circle. They're influenced by the gravitational pull of the moon Galatea. And finally, Uranus's mysterious rings, like red and blue ones, puzzle scientists. We have no idea where they came from. Same with Super Saturn and a centaur we mentioned before. The rings in our solar system have their own future. 
The sad truth is that Saturn will lose its iconic rings one day. NASA's Cassini spacecraft show that they're slowly being pulled into the planet by gravity and magnetic fields. It happens so fast that Saturn's ring ring could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool every half hour. So one day, what was once a spectacular sight stretching 22 times the length of Earth will shrink to almost nothing, becoming just a tiny part of Saturn. But hey, don't worry, despite the speed, it will take about 1 to 300 million years for all the rings to fully vanish. But there's an upside. Mars might gain its own rings one day, although it will take a long time too. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars could witness its moon Phobos breaking apart and forming a dazzling band around the planet. The pieces that don't contribute to the ring will create craters on the Martian surface. So let's hope we won't live on this planet by that time. Scientists in NASA hope to study the rings of different planets better in the future. In the meantime, the James Webb Space Telescope will keep scanning and analyzing them. Let's hope that we'll learn more about their mysteries and our solar system's history. We still can't find the source of the mysterious signal we've been receiving since 2018. We receive it every 22 minutes, and nothing can explain this. Some scientists even believe it could be coming from another civilization we haven't met yet. This strange radio signal wasn't found by a scientist on a serious mission. It was actually discovered by a college student just doing a regular project for school. Tyrone O'Doherty, an undergrad student at Curtin University in Australia, was sifting through old data of the southern sky. He was looking for any weird blinking radio signals. He finally stumbled upon one from 2018 that seemed to shoot radio waves towards Earth like a lighthouse beam. Excited about his find, Tyrone shared it with his mentor radio astronomer Natasha Hurley-Walker. She dove into researching this signal, hoping for a breakthrough. But despite checking different frequency data, they hit a dead end. But then, Natasha spotted a pattern. The signal repeated every 18 minutes. This was huge. But just as they were gearing up to study it further, poof! The signal vanished after only three months, leaving them with nothing. Not giving up, Natasha and her team scanned the skies again, desperate for a clue. Months passed, but nothing turned up. They were ready to give up, and then suddenly, a new signal popped up. This one kept blinking for five minutes, then it disappeared. And then it came back exactly 22 minutes later. The main question was if that signal was related to an 18-minute one. To figure it out, Natasha went back to the old radio data from that area. As they dug deeper, they realized that, yes, and these signals aren't anything new. They've been beaming towards Earth for 35 years. Back in 1988, Indian and American telescopes had caught them, but they got buried under tons of other data. This was great news for space explorers, because it meant they could now calculate how far away this mysterious object was. After doing the math, they figured out it was incredibly far, even on a space scale, 15,000 light-years from Earth. Now, the only thing left to uncover was what exactly this object was. Walker and his team started comparing it to all the known radio-emitting objects out there. Yet its source remains a mystery. The signals still pop up every 22 minutes on NASA screens, always ending with a frustrating match-not-found message. The scientists called it J183910. Some think that the signal might come from some extraterrestrial beings. Maybe it's the signal that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been waiting for. This project has been working for over 50 years, trying to find any evidence of life beyond Earth. They also scan the skies for radio waves, laser pulses, and other mysterious signals. So, maybe it's a way for extraterrestrial folk to communicate their location. While that idea may sound exciting, we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. First, we don't have solid proof for that. 
before any concrete evidence, it's just speculation. And also, there are other more plausible explanations. Most likely, it comes from a natural phenomenon, and there are a couple of theories for that. The first one is the pulsar theory. Imagine a huge star in space much bigger than our sun. Sometimes these big stars finish their life journeys in a spectacular event called a supernova. When this happens, the star's core collapses, becoming super compact, as if you're squeezing all the stuff from that star into a tiny space. That tiny, super dense core is called a neutron star. Some of these neutron stars are extra special. We call them pulsars. They get their name because they seem to pulse with energy, like a space lighthouse. These pulsars have incredibly strong magnetic fields, much stronger than what you'd find on Earth. They're like enormous magnets in space. Because of this, they shoot out beams of energy. They're also spinning super fast, so these beams of energy seem to pulse on and off as they spin around. Now, the strange signal we detected seems to have similarities with pulsars. But not quite. Pulsars usually have a predictable lifespan and slow down over time, eventually stopping their radio signals. In contrast, our mysterious signal is quite persistent and is blinking beyond what's expected for pulsars. So, maybe it's not a typical pulsar, or not a pulsar at all. There's also a magnetar theory. Now, a magnetar is another type of neutron star. They're like supercharged versions of pulsars, with even stronger magnetic fields and slightly longer pulsating periods. Maybe this is what causes our signal's intense persistence. However, when we plotted the data, we also realized the signal didn't match the magnetar's vibes either. Magnetars not only send out radio waves, but also powerful X-rays because they're so energetic. But the signal we received was only sending out radio waves. So, we figured it's not a pulsar and not a magnetar. The signal's behavior is very strange and suggests an unnatural source. This means there might be something in the universe that scientists haven't fully explored yet. And there is a space object that we don't know much about. The final theory is the so-called dwarf pulsar. Sounds a little dopey to me. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Now, a dwarf pulsar is like a star that blinks with light flashes, similar to pulsars, but it takes longer for each blink. Usually, white dwarfs are the leftovers from smaller stars. They don't blink because their magnetic field isn't as strong as pulsars. But when a white dwarf becomes pretty hefty, almost the mass of our sun, it gets super dense and starts pulsating with a strong magnetic field, just like pulsars. They have a cool quirk. White dwarfs are made of electrons, not neutrons like pulsars. When these charged electrons start dancing with a magnetic field, they shoot out periodic light flashes, which happen every 100 to 1,000 seconds. As you remember, our signal has a period of 22 minutes, 1,320 seconds. A bit longer than the usual white dwarf pulsars, but it's much closer to the truth. So far, this sounds like the most plausible explanation. But even this theory isn't fully confirmed yet. This just shows how much there is in the universe that we're still figuring out. For example, fast radio bursts, another mysterious type of signal we've been detecting. They're like quick, intense bursts of energy in the form of radio waves. They have a ton of energy. FRBs are so powerful that sometimes they can be brighter than entire galaxies. Now, imagine this. They release as much energy in a few milliseconds as our sun does in three whole days. Wow! These bursts happen all over the sky with huge frequencies, although some have been detected with lower frequencies. Every day, we catch around 10,000 random FRBs in the sky. Some of them repeat, but most happen once and disappear forever. Unfortunately, most of them only last for a fraction of a second, and by the time their energy reaches us, it's a thousand times weaker than a mobile phone signal from the moon. This is why, despite their brightness, there's still a lot we don't understand about them. We're still trying to figure out what causes these FRBs. They could be coming from different sources, 
like already mentioned magnetars, colliding stars, or even merging galaxies or white dwarfs. As these bursts travel through space, they pick up information about the cosmic environments they pass through, like interstellar gas clouds. It's very unlikely that FRBs are some messages from extraterrestrial beings, though. Not only because there are thousands of them every day all across the sky, but also because we know that the sources of these bursts must be incredibly energetic themselves. Our neighbors would have to have equipment stronger than entire galaxies for that. But the bottom line is, while all these signals are fascinating, there's still a ton to learn about them. Now imagine a place where a single day lasts longer than a whole year. On Venus, a day, meaning one full spin on its axis, is as long as 243 Earth days. And what's even weirder, despite the fact that Venus is experiencing a never-ending day, it has a shorter year than Earth. While Earth takes about 365 days to complete one orbit around the Sun, Venus does it in just 225 days. So, somehow, for Venus, a day is more epic than a whole year. Venus is a strange planet in general. It's called Earth's twin because of how alike we are, although it's a bit smaller than Earth. But there are some drastic differences, too. For example, it spins in the opposite direction, which means the sun there rises in the west and sets in the east. And Venus isn't the only one who dances to its own rhythm. Uranus does that, too. And finally, Venus is quite crazy in terms of its atmosphere. When you stand on Earth, you don't really feel the weight of the air around you. Well, on Venus, that feeling would be like having an elephant sitting on your shoulders. Venus has 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere there is a thick layer of toxic gases. For example, carbon dioxide that's released by all the volcanoes. It presses down with incredible force. This results in very hot temperatures. No wonder it'll take a long time before we'll be able to stand on this planet. Meanwhile, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has an even more speedy orbit than Venus. It completes a full journey around the Sun in just about 88 Earth days. However, it has a slow spin on its axis, which means that one day on Mercury takes about 176 Earth days, basically half a year. Just like with Venus, a day there takes much longer than a year. Since it's closest to the Sun, no wonder Mercury experiences some super extreme temperature swings. Daytime temperatures can soar up to a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. But wait for the sunset. At night, it drops to freezing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. That's because Mercury doesn't have a thick atmosphere like we do, so the heat doesn't distribute across the planet evenly. If one side is in the dark, it'll be super cold and the other side will be scorching hot, just like if you let a regular big rock lie down under the sun for a while. In fact, it's so cold that there might even be some ice on it. Look at the planet's north polar region, especially those sunlit yellow spots inside craters. These are indications of water ice. Turns out water is much more common in space than we thought. Mars is often dubbed the red planet. It earns this nickname from the abundance of iron oxide, or rust, covering its surface. The iron-rich minerals create a rusty red hue that paints the Martian landscape. But it turns out, Mars isn't just red. If you were standing on Mars, you'd witness desert-like butterscotch terrain with caramel and golden glows, some brown, and even a glimpse of a slight greenish hue. Mars also has the biggest mountain in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons standing at a staggering height of about 13.6 miles tall. It's even taller than Mount Everest. It was formed by the volcanic eruption yielding low-viscosity lava, creating a shield-like structure. Since Mars is covered in sand, it's also famous for its crazy dust storms. But it turns out they're even more insane than we thought. These storms can last for months. While they might present challenges for future human missions, they also contribute to the planet's mesmerizing appearance when observed from afar. And not only storms, but even its own Mars quakes. Also known as seismic tremors, they were first detected by NASA in 2019. Unlike earthquakes that are often triggered by tectonic plate movements, 
Martian quakes are thought to result from the cooling and contracting of the planet's interior. It's interesting how similar, yet how different the planets are. Saturn's iconic rings might hold a secret link to Earth's ancient past. The rings are composed mainly of ice particles and debris and are estimated to be relatively young in space terms, perhaps just a few hundred million years old. Now, there are some theories that propose that they were born after some catastrophic event. For example, the collision of two large moons or the breakup of a comet. What's interesting is that this timeline coincides with the age of the dinosaur's demise on Earth. Could there be a connection? <laughs> Who knows? By the way, while Saturn takes the crown for its rings, it's not the only planet in our solar system sporting them. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own set of rings, although they might not be as visible and cool as Saturn's. However, there's something where Saturn truly stands out – the magnificent hexagon at its North Pole. It's a colossal six-sided figure. Each side of this incredible structure measures around 9,000 miles long, which is 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. Scientists aren't sure how it was formed or why. They think it might be due to varying wind speeds. Or maybe it's shaped by a localized, slow, meandering jet stream. So far, it remains another of Saturn's mysteries. Much like Saturn's hexagon, Jupiter also has its own weird spot. It's called the Great Red Spot. This is a storm that's been raging for at least 350 years and is larger than Earth itself. Despite its name, the spot's coloration has varied over the years, ranging from brick red to pale salmon. Scientists continue to study this enduring storm, unlocking the mysteries of its persistence and ever-changing hues. Meteorologically, the Great Red Spot is a powerhouse. It generates enormous pressure in Jupiter's southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, Jupiter itself is a powerhouse when it comes to magnetic fields. Its magnetic influence is colossal. It extends far beyond the planet itself and creates one of the largest and strongest magnetic fields in our solar system. Because of that, Jupiter is a source of intense radiation and mesmerizing auroras. While Earth's northern lights are breathtaking, Jupiter has something to offer too. The magnetic field interacts with charged particles from Jupiter's moons and the solar wind. This creates visually striking auroras near its poles. But compared to Earth, the scale of these auroras is incredible, like nothing we've seen on our planet. But even having a cool big spot isn't a unique feature in our solar system. A stormy giant Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from the Sun, also has its great dark spot. Just like Jupiter, it's a massive vortex in Neptune's atmosphere. But unlike its Jupiter counterpart, this spot tends to come and go because of Neptune's dynamic and ever-changing weather patterns. Neptune, together with Uranus, is known as an ice giant. And just like other giants, it boasts some of the most ferocious winds in our solar system. Its supersonic winds can get faster than 2,200 miles per hour. What a drama queen! but this explains its thick cloud formations. By the way, if you ever dreamed of a planet raining diamonds, you might want to visit this planet. Deep within Neptune's atmosphere, where pressures are extreme, scientists theorize that carbon atoms are compressed and form diamonds. And then, these diamonds might be raining down. What a unique touch to stormy weather! Neptune's moons got from their parent with the weird weather. For example, its largest moon, Triton, has a touch of cryovolcanism. Instead of spewing molten rock like Earth's volcanoes, Triton's cryovolcanoes erupt with a mix of water, ammonia, and nitrogen. Picture it as icy geysers shooting material into space. Seems like in our solar system alone, each planet has its own quirks and interesting qualities. Let's hope that we discover some more interesting things in outer space in the future. It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe.
For example, look at the closest to us, Stellar Nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke, and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. And Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf ray at stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot. But their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf and, thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor, but those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope 
has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age five to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life, and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. We often see humans living on other planets like Mars. Colonizing our solar system and beyond has long been a dream of humankind. The idea of humans going to space dates back to at least 1610. A German astronomer named Johannes Kepler wrote to an Italian astronomer named Galileo. Kepler said that we could create ships to travel in space and even create maps of the stars. People got more excited about space during the famous space race. NASA was created in the 50s. They did many cool things, like sending space stations, Mars rovers, and exploring other planets. All this made space travel seem more real. Today, we've developed to the point where we finally discuss the possibility of space tourism. We're already sending regular people into space. Only very rich people, of course. But many believe that, in just a few decades, space tourism will become normal. We'll be able to fly to Earth's orbit and back, as if on some kind of tour. Spaceships will replace airplanes, and it will only take two hours to get from Australia to England. And finally, we'll begin to travel to other planets in our solar system. Some scientists even believe we'll have colonies on the Moon or Mars by the 2060s. In the future, we could colonize not only Mars, but some of the moons, like our own, Ceres, Titan, and others. But the thing is, why do we even want to live on other planets? Surprising question, huh? Sure, the answer might seem obvious at first glance. Mm -hmm. Humans want to learn about space and other planets. 
This curiosity is what led us to other big discoveries like going to the Antarctic and the moon. Next, safety, of course. Humans have a moral duty to ensure our survival. Colonizing space could protect us from disasters that might wipe out life on Earth. Plus, by settling space, we improve our chances of survival and fulfill a moral obligation to do so. Besides, with Earth's overpopulation, colonizing other planets could relieve the strain on our home planet. Another thing is, colonizing a planet means living there and using its resources. And let me tell you, there are lots of resources in space. Our solar system alone has things to use for fuel, like Titan. Space colonization could bring us clean energy, access to new materials, new technologies, and so on. The more we colonize space and learn about it, the more we could benefit humanity, more technology, more exploration, more innovation, and so on. History also says explorers are way less likely to get into fights. Expanding and exploring, scientists claim, keeps us busy with cool discoveries, growth, and research. The more we explore, the less we're stuck with our earthly problems. But on the other hand, not everyone is interested in going to space. And maybe colonizing space isn't as good an idea as it seems. First of all, is it even possible? Some people say that living in space is just too far-fetched. You might have heard about terraforming. Terraforming basically means changing and improving the planet however we want, as if we were in some character maker in a video game. Sounds great, in theory. In reality, terraforming Mars, for example, could take hundreds of years and cost millions of dollars, according to experts. Colonizing our moon could cost an unimaginable $104 billion. It's seven times NASA's yearly budget. And that's not even counting the earthly costs. But the biggest, most important question is, is it really that cool to live in space, though? Space isn't your cozy home at all. Most celestial bodies are radiation hotspots, all because of the solar winds. Imagine a wind so fierce that it can strip planets of their very atmospheres. Our sun is a real danger to each planet in the system. Yes, including our own Earth. Stars are crazy powerful. They shoot out charged particles all the time. These particles can zoom around at incredible speeds, going up to 5 million miles per hour. These gusts of particles can leave an entire planet all barren. Poof! No more life-sustaining air. The water on the planet would evaporate, then freeze. The temperature would plummet to very chilling. And even daytime skies would be as black as night. Lucky for us, Earth has an amazing shield called a magnetosphere. It protects us from these space winds. But scientists are studying these winds to help us find other friendly planets out there. By checking out stars' properties, gravity, and magnetic fields, we can see if their planets can truly host life. And it's very hard to find a planet that isn't showered by radiation all the time. It has to have a very thick atmosphere, like on Earth, to prevent this from happening. Unfortunately, we haven't discovered any planets like this so far, which is why living in space would mean dealing with crazy health problems. Temperatures and radiation are just the beginning. What about muscle loss, troubles with vision and many other things? Humans are way too vulnerable for that. Robots are more suited for space exploration due to its hostile conditions. Let's take Mars, for example. The red planet is freezing and very uninviting. In fact, the Earth could face almost anything, even mega problems, and still be better than Mars. Mars is a desert with barely any water, very far from the idea of a dream home. Let's imagine that the Earth's air get polluted. Mars still wouldn't be better. The air there is super thin and 96% carbon dioxide. Earth's air is a cakewalk compared to that. Or even if a huge asteroid crashes into Earth, we're still better off here than on other planets. It might even be a pretty big asteroid, like the one that wiped off the dinosaurs. This event was absolutely catastrophic, plunging the Earth into utter chaos. It created a massive crater called the Chicxulub Crater. 
The impact led to massive fires, tsunamis, and a lot of dust and debris flying into the sky. The dust and debris blocked out the sun for a long time. Can you imagine what happens when there's no sunlight at all for a while? Everything got really cold and dark. This darkness and coldness affected plants and animals. Without sunlight, plants couldn't make food through photosynthesis, and that meant many animals lost their source of food. And these were only short-term consequences. Of course, many species became extinct because of that. But even with all that, 25% of species managed to survive somehow. If this same asteroid had hit Mars, the outcome would have been much worse. Mars doesn't have enough things like water and air to support life like Earth does, so the consequences would be way harsher. Actually, the Earth survived not one, but five mass extinctions. And life still managed to thrive on our planet, even after all that. As you can see, it's almost impossible to make the Earth completely inhabitable. Our planet will always be the most habitable place compared to anywhere else in our solar system, unless we do something extremely insane, which is why we need to protect it. Here we come to the famous, the Earth's in trouble argument. If something bad happens to our planet, why not focus on fixing it instead of flying away? Critics argue that if we can't take care of Earth, we shouldn't spread our problems to other planets or moons. Are we really capable of responsibly colonizing other worlds if we can't even manage our own? Plus, there's still so much to explore even on our own planet. Humans haven't even lived in Antarctica or under Earth's oceans yet. Are we sure we're ready for worlds that are even more extreme than that? So, even if Earth gets into trouble, we shouldn't just ditch it. We have to work together and create safe zones. It would be a big challenge, sure, but it's still way more doable and cheaper than building space colonies. Of course, the idea of humans living in space and traveling to other planets is very exciting, but we should never forget our sweet home, and we should remember that life isn't science fiction. We should use our technology rationally and focus on making the Earth safer and better. And what do you think about it? Living on our beautiful planet might seem safe, but only until you start thinking of all those dangers lurking just around the corner or in the vast darkness of the cosmos. Let's see what may eventually lead to the end of planet Earth. With each new potential threat, it gets more and more terrifying. Consider yourself warned. First of all, let's talk about Hypercane. This natural disaster can get really extreme. A hypercane is a theoretical hurricane of unsurpassed power. It would occur if the ocean became overheated as a result of climate change, or a massive volcanic eruption could trigger it. In any case, these conditions would create a hurricane, which, unlike regular hurricanes, would stretch way beyond the lower stratosphere. The speed of such a storm would reach 500 miles per hour. The pressure inside the hypercane would be so low that it wouldn't let it wear out as quickly as other hurricanes. The hypercane could last for weeks on end. But the worst thing? It would likely damage or even destroy part of Earth's ozone layer, and the hole could be the size of the entire North American continent. Then we've got super destructive tornadoes. A tornado is a violently rotating column of air. It usually extends from a thunderstorm and is in contact with the ground. Inside a thundercloud, warm, humid air rises upward and cool air falls down along with rain or hail. Such conditions can lead to the appearance of spinning air currents inside the cloud. Interestingly, these air currents start out horizontal, but at one point they can become vertical and drop down from the cloud, becoming a tornado. Some tornadoes are narrow, rope-like swirls, but others turn into wild funnels. Tornadoes are ranked with the help of the enhanced Fujita scale. A weak tornado normally lasts for a few minutes and doesn't move faster than 100 miles per hour. The next level is a strong tornado. Such whirlwinds can last for 20 minutes or so and have winds of up to 200 miles per hour. And then we can also have violent tornadoes. Those can last for more than an hour and move at a speed of between 200 and 300 miles per hour. 
On average, around 1,000 tornadoes occur in the USA every year. There's even a region that got named Tornado Alley. It's a 10-state area in the Midwest, but tornadoes can happen in any state. One of the most destructive natural disasters was the Tri-State Tornado in the USA. It was the world's longest-lasting single tornado that traveled 220 miles through Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. At the same time, the average tornado's path is usually no longer than five miles. But what if one day, a tornado much bigger and way more powerful than any we've experienced before swiped through countries and continents? It would leave behind total destruction and devastation. And how about a supercell thunderstorm? It's the least common type of thunderstorm, but it's the most dangerous. It's likely to cause severe weather, damaging winds, very large hail, and even violent tornadoes. What makes supercells unique is a deep and persistent rotating updraft called a mesocyclone. Supercells can potentially last for hours and cause great havoc. An asteroid impact could end all forms of life on Earth, too. If a space wanderer was large enough, it could cause widespread devastation, like it happened with the nine-mile-wide asteroid from 66 million years ago. It's rumored to have destroyed three-quarters of the planet's plant and animal species, including dinosaurs. Depending on the asteroid's size and the speed of its approach, the impact could lead to massive fires, tsunamis, and the eternal winter effect. It happens when the debris ejected into the atmosphere blocks sunlight and disrupts the global climate. Luckily, we'd probably notice such a large asteroid coming close to our planet with the help of our equipment long before the collision and would have enough time to get rid of this threat. It would be our very own sun that would bring our world to an end. Our star is a gigantic, constantly changing ball of molten gases. Every once in a while, it spews out bursts of energy solar flares. They often go hand in hand with something called coronal mass ejections. Those are giant bubbles of ionized gas that can accelerate to incredible speeds. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison to solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot with the temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. Scientists classify solar flares depending on how brightly they shine in X-rays. You aren't likely to notice the tiniest flares if you don't have special equipment. Medium solar flares lead to fleeting radio blackouts at the poles, but nothing too serious. It's X-class flares people should worry about. They cause the strongest and longest lasting solar storms. Now, if you had gamma ray vision, you'd be able to see immensely bright flashes. They occur every day outshine everything around you, and then disappear again. Those flashes are gamma-ray bursts. One of them could wipe out Earth's atmosphere. The flash that might ruin our planet would most probably be born in a faraway galaxy during a merge of two collapsing stars. It would be immensely powerful and super bright. Still 1,000 light-years from Earth, it'd already shine as bright as the sun. Our planet's atmosphere would try to protect us, but its natural shield wouldn't last. The radiation would be so powerful that it would literally cook the atmosphere. It would create nitrogen oxides that would destroy the ozone layer. Without this layer, ultraviolet rays coming from the sun would be hitting Earth's surface at full force. They would wipe out tiny plankton in the ocean. But these plankton produce from 50 to 70% of all oxygen in the world. So, with their disappearance, there would be a severe lack of oxygen, which would lead to the disappearance of life on the planet. In the end, the heat and ultraviolet light coming from the sun would turn the planet into a huge chunk of rock. And what if we came across a wandering black hole? You might know that a black hole is a region in space where gravity is so powerful that not even light can escape its clutches. Luckily, the nearest to us black hole is 1,500 light-years away. 
It seems that we have nothing to worry about until we learn about wandering black holes. Now, things definitely get way creepier. If such a black hole entered the solar system, Earth would be doomed. We wouldn't stand a chance against this space monster. In 2020, 13 wandering black holes were spotted not so far away from our planet. But not far away in space terms means around 1 billion light years away, so we've got some time left. Plus, the possibility of such a disaster is very, very low. One day, a rogue planet might push Earth out of the habitable zone and into an extreme orbit farther from the Sun. Then the climate all over the planet would start getting colder and colder. Don't forget that the farther our planet is from the Sun, the weaker the star's gravitational pull on our planet is. In the end, our beautiful Earth would get too far away from its main source of light and heat. It would turn into a lifeless piece of rock covered with a thick layer of ice. Or the Sun might expand and turn into a red giant. If it happened, it would change the entire habitable zone of our solar system. The disaster would start with our star running out of hydrogen in its core. This would trigger a chain of reactions, which would eventually lead to the core of the Sun heating up and getting denser. As a result, the Sun would get way larger than it is now. During this transformation, the Sun would swallow Venus, Mercury, and Earth. The universe is a big, mysterious, and ever-changing place. But just like we have baby photos that show how we looked when we were little, scientists also have a baby picture of the universe. Only they were able to look 14 billion years into the past. How is it possible? Well, let's figure it out. Imagine winning the Oscars of science for a picture that shows the entire universe when it was just a baby. Scientists achieved this fantastic feat using NASA's Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. To take this picture, they built a super cool satellite, launched it into space, and collected massive amounts of data about the universe. This image turned out to be a cosmic treasure trove. It helped answer some of the universe's biggest questions, but also revealed a few new mysteries. This groundbreaking data confirmed the standard model of cosmology and told us that our universe is around 13.7 billion years old. Plus, it showed us that the elements in our regular periodic table make up only a tiny fraction of the universe's recipe. To be honest, this is not quite a photo in the usual sense. Of course, we cannot actually photograph what happened so long ago. The picture we're talking about is called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB for short. Now, the CMB is like a faint glowing light that fills up the entire universe in every direction. These clues that can help us understand how the universe evolved into what it is today CMB is a super cool glow that fills up the entire universe. You see, when you look through a regular telescope, the space between stars and galaxies seems pretty dark. But with an amazing radio telescope, we can actually detect that this empty, dark space is filled with a super faint and even glow. This glow is all around us, and it's not coming from any star or galaxy. This is the cosmic microwave background, and it's strongest in the microwave part of the radio spectrum. The CMB is a frozen treasure, super chilly at around minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit. Bruh, that's colder than any winter you've experienced. This ancient light formed about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which happened around 14 billion years ago. So we're looking way back in time. In the beginning, the universe was like a thick fog of incredibly hot plasma. It was almost 500 million degrees Fahrenheit. It was so hot that atoms couldn't even exist yet. Only wild electrons and protons bouncing around like crazy. Because of this super hot fog, 
any light that tried to travel got scattered by those mischievous electrons. It was basically like trying to see through a foggy car windshield. But then, the universe started expanding in all directions, just like a cosmic balloon getting bigger and bigger. And it's still expanding today. As the universe did that, it began to cool down. When it turned 380,000 years old, it finally cooled enough for electrons and protons to come together. These tiny particles started to combine, forming mostly hydrogen atoms. When that happened, the universe finally became transparent, like a clear window. The moment of this magical transition is called the recombination epoch. Once the foggy era ended, the light could travel freely. The universe became like a vast playground for light to bounce around and explore. And, as you know, light has a certain speed. 186,000 miles per second, to be specific. And it takes some time for light from distant places to reach us. So, in other words, the CMB is the oldest light in the universe. It's like a capture from a moment when the universe just started to become clear and transparent. As this light traveled through space, it went through all sorts of adventures, like the formation of stars and galaxies. Along the way, it lost some energy and transformed into microwaves, which our eyes can't see, and that can be detected only with special tools. Also, there are some tricky things that can mess with the data. For example, galaxy clusters. These are big groups of galaxies hanging out together in space. When the ancient light from the CMB travels across the universe, it encounters these groups, and these sneaky clusters try to leave their marks on the CMB. They distort the patterns in the ancient glow, like smudging the ink in the important ancient book. That's why scientists have to invent techniques and supercomputers to help clean up this mess and decode everything properly. Due to all this, the CMB isn't perfectly smooth. It has a few little bumps and patterns. These weird patterns make it unique, kind of like the universe's fingerprint. Scientists have been using amazing tools like the Cosmic Background Explorer and Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe to study these patterns. The COBE, our cosmic camera, took the first ever map of the sky in microwaves from 1989 to 1993. Why do we study it? Well, because the CMB can help us learn so much about the early universe. Stuff like how it expanded, how much normal matter and mysterious dark matter it had, and even the overall shape of the universe, and much more. We're basically playing detective with the cosmos, trying to decode the mysteries of our world by little clues and prints. What are the results? Well, awesome tools like the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe helped us to learn more incredible facts. For example, we found out that we can actually only see 5% of the universe. Imagine the universe as a cosmic pie. Scientists learned that 68% of it is made up of something called dark energy, and 27% is dark matter. Only a tiny 5% is made of normal matter, the one that we, humans, can see. So, most of the universe is like this hidden realm we can't even imagine. We also found out what happened in the beginning of times. Picture the universe right after the Big Bang, it was so tiny, way smaller than a proton. Everything we see today was crammed into this itsy-bitsy space. The rules of quantum mechanics, which let weird and wild things happen, were in full swing back then. Matter and energy were like playful adventurers, borrowing from the future and disappearing into nothingness. Then, cosmic inflation happened, and the universe suddenly expanded like popcorn on a cosmic scale. It became a trillion trillion times bigger than it was, creating waves of gravitational chaos everywhere. 
Some gravitational waves filled the baby universe like a sea, and their patterns left unique fingerprints on the CMB light. And all that learned thanks to the pictures of the CMB. Anyway, NASA has this awesome plan to study the universe's baby picture. They're going to use a really cool observatory called PIPER, which stands for Primordial Inflation Polarization Explorer. Imagine Piper as a special space balloon that's going to fly up high in the sky from a place called Fort Sumner in New Mexico. It has two powerful telescopes that sit in a hot tub-sized container filled with liquid helium. This liquid helium is super cold at around minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit. But Piper loves the chill because it's extremely sensitive. What is its mission? to learn all about the early days of the universe, right from its first baby picture. When Piper is up there, it's going to look very carefully at the CMB, trying to find some hidden patterns that hold the secrets of how the universe grew and changed over time. This spy with a magnifying glass will be examining 85% of the sky. Piper's launch is scheduled for late September, you can even watch the exciting balloon filling action live on the Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility website. It's going to be out of this world fun. So the cosmic microwave background is like a time traveling storyteller, giving us valuable clues about the universe's incredible past. Isn't that awesome? Space is full of surprises and there's so much more to discover. Keep your eyes on the stars and who knows what else we'll find out there. What if the sun went boom? Well, you can guess it would be super bad news for us. Hmm, this was sure a short video, huh? Nah, wait, I have more. If the sun blew up, chaos would ensue in our solar system. But scientists tell us that it will certainly happen one day. But why? How exactly would events unfold? And is it possible for us to somehow survive this event? Hey, hey let's delve into it. First of all, get ready for a journey to the Sun's core. The Sun's heart is packed with hydrogen atoms, having an out-of-this-world dance party. These atoms are so excited that they smash into each other with all their might. And when they collide, something magical happens. It's called nuclear fusion. And in this fusion fiesta, the hydrogen atoms combine to form helium atoms, a chemistry experiment on a grand scale. During this nuclear fusion, a teeny bit of mass from the hydrogen atoms is transformed into a massive amount of energy. It's Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared coming into play. Energy is unleashed in the form of light and heat, radiating outwards to brighten up the entire solar system. And once all these processes get going, a bunch of energized particles called photons join the fun. These photons are like tiny packets of light bouncing and zipping around in all directions. They play a crucial role in carrying the sun's energy through space, illuminating our world and warming our cozy planet. But to keep all this going, so that atoms don't escape and create complete chaos, the sun's core needs to be under tremendous pressure. This pressure comes from the immense weight of the sun's outer layers pressing down on the core. The outer layers are squeezing the inner core. But the inner layers don't give up. The energy created from fusion and the bustling photon party tries really hard to escape the sun's core. But the core is so dense, like me, and the pressure is so big that the energy takes its sweet time to make its way out. It bounces around, gets absorbed, and re-emitted by other particles. Eventually, after a long time, it reaches the sun's surface and zooms off into space, reaching us as sunlight. So now you know how the sun works. Now, what happens once it reaches the end of its life? Well, here's the twist. Our sun has a limited supply of hydrogen fuel. In about 5 billion years, it'll run out of its fuel. After that, the star will undergo some big changes. Now, pay attention, because there's a pretty good chance we're all going to miss this. First, the sun will puff up and become a red giant, exploding like a balloon. It will grow so big that it will swallow up the inner planets, including our beloved Earth. Talk about a sun taking up all the space. 
so we won't even see the end of our sun unless we move somewhere further away. After the red giant phase, the sun will shrink a bit. Its outer layers will fade away into space, leaving behind a beautiful planetary nebula. It'll be revealing its glowing core. Ooh! The core, now filled with helium, will start sounding weird. And will start fusing heavier elements like oxygen and carbon. These reactions won't be as energetic, like a party with less dancing and more chill vibes. Eventually, even the helium will be used up, and the sun will become a compact white dwarf, a stellar retiree enjoying its retirement home. Scientists estimate that the sun has about 7 to 8 billion years left before it dims its lights. Don't worry though, by that time, humanity might have traveled to far off galaxies, or maybe even evolved into amazing space beings. So our sun won't go out with a bang like fireworks, it's not big enough to become a supernova or a black hole. Those stellar superstars need way more mass than our sun to pull off those cosmic tricks. But what if it blew up very suddenly, just like an abrupt event without any reason? Well, let's see. Imagine this, the sun goes boom and Earth is in for a wild ride. The event unleashes an insane amount of energy, sending a shockwave racing through space at the speed of light. It takes about 8 minutes for this shockwave to reach Earth. Why? Well, the sun is a whopping 93 million miles away from us on average. So it takes a little over 8 minutes and 20 seconds for the sun's light to travel all that distance and reach us. But let's talk about the event itself. It would be a great sight to witness, but sadly, it would also be the end. Roll credits. The crazy amounts of unleashed energy would cause the sun to expand rapidly, again swallowing up the inner planets, including our Earth. And that's not all. Brace yourself for a massive burst of radiation. The sun would unleash a torrent of supercharged particles. We're talking about X-rays and gamma rays, the kind that can seriously mess things up. When these high-energy particles hit the atmosphere, they go wild, causing all sorts of chaos. They ionize the atmosphere, creating a ginormous electromagnetic pulse. This pulse is like a shockwave for electronic devices. It fries them, zaps them, and leaves them useless. So if your gadgets aren't protected, they're in for a rough time. Speaking of rough times, after that, it's instant vaporization for our planet. But the sun's grand finale just doesn't mess with Earth. It wreaks havoc on the entire solar system. That massive burst of energy would be crashing into everything in its path. Planets and other objects get knocked off of their cozy orbits, causing chaos and unpredictability. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? Kapow! It's gone, obliterated, or scattered to the cosmic winds. And even planets that will survive this event will probably go off their orbits to wander somewhere. And let's not forget about the outer planets, like Jupiter and Saturn. These giants generate their own internal heat, which keeps them cozy and attracts lots of moons. But the sun's boom would steal their warmth, turning them into incredibly cold places. And now that we've discussed how catastrophic all this would be for everything in our solar system, let's ask the logical question. Can humanity make it? The short answer is, nope, we wouldn't make it. Everything would be wiped out, except maybe some sneaky bacteria hiding in the shadows. But in a crazy scenario where the sun gave us a heads up about its plans, we might have a fighting chance. If we knew in advance and had time to prepare, we could get our survival gears turning. So what could we do? Since Earth itself won't survive the sun's tantrum, we'd have to move somewhere. Remember how we mentioned that not all planets would be completely destroyed? Well, sadly, the ones closest to the Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Earth would disappear. So the easiest option would be to move to some other solar system with its own Earth-like planet. But what if the Earth somehow managed to survive this catastrophe? Let's not think about how it happened and just discuss the consequences. Well, our climate would go crazy. During the first moments of the Sun's kaboom, the radiation and particles would crank up the temperature big time, like a never-ending heat wave. We're talking major greenhouse effect. The oceans would evaporate, creating thick, fluffy clouds that trap heat and refuse to let it escape into space. And after that, without the sun's warm embrace, the Earth would quickly become an icy freezer. 
So we'd have to think outside the box. One idea would be to take shelter deep underground, where we won't be that much affected by radiation and sudden temperature changes. As you dig deeper, the temperature rises. So with the right tools and resources, humanity could hunker down in fortified bunkers, surviving for a couple of years without the sun's rays. Why just a couple of years? Well, remember how we said the sun is a gravity center of our solar system? Without it, Earth would be adrift in search of a new center of gravity. Imagine our planet, our trusty satellite, the moon, and all the other planets slowly floating away into space. Luckily, our trusty sun is hanging in there, keeping us warm and shining for many more cosmic adventures to come. So we're safe for a few billion years. But it's always fun to imagine impossible scenarios. So stay tuned for more What Ifs. Have you ever wondered why all planets are perfectly round? And what if these celestial bodies decided to break the rules and change their shape? Would we end up with square planets, triangular moons, or maybe even intergalactic shapes we can't even imagine? Well, let's find out. So how do planets form in the first place? The universe is filled with swirling clouds of dust and gas. These clouds, called molecular clouds, consist of various elements and compounds such as hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, and so on. They're like a cosmic kitchen filled with the ingredients needed to cook up some brand new planets. The first step in the recipe for planetary formation is called the accretion theory. Let's say that something happens that causes gravitational instability. Like a supernova goes off nearby or something. This pushes the gas and dust in the cloud and causes them to come together. Because of gravity, these particles start falling toward a central point. They become more tightly packed together, like when you squeeze a ball in your hand. And eventually, they're squeezed so hard that the cloud starts to flatten into a disk shape, kind of like when you mix flour and water to make pizza dough. This disk is called a protoplanetary disk. It's also spinning because the cloud's particles had some rotation to begin with. Now, imagine these tiny dust particles and gas molecules dancing around in the disk. Sometimes, they bump into each other. And when they do, they stick together like Velcro. These little clumps of dust and gas are called planetesimals. They're the building blocks of planets. And as the planetesimals continued to collide and merge, they grew larger and larger, forming protoplanets. The protoplanets were getting serious about their size, and their gravity became stronger. Some of them got so massive that they became the grand masters of their cosmic neighborhoods, the planets we know and love. Each planet had its own unique recipe of gases, rocks, and sometimes even water. But why do the planets look like spheres? Well, it's all because of gravity. Let's go back to our protoplanets. Imagine you're squeezing a balloon with your hands. The air inside of the balloon pushes back, creating pressure. Something similar happens with planets. Gravity squeezes its material inward, pulling in towards the center. And since gravity acts equally in all directions, it pulls material from all sides toward the center of mass, resulting in a sphere-like shape. And that material pushes back with pressure, resisting the force of gravity. In the end, they both find a sweet spot where they balance each other out. It's called hydrostatic equilibrium. A fancy term that means everything inside a planet is in balance. But that's not all. Another thing that makes the planet spherical is their rotation. Think about a ball of Play-Doh or something like that. Imagine you spin it rapidly. The material starts to push outward, making the Play-Doh bulge at the equator and flatten at the poles. The same thing happens to planets as they spin on their axes. The combination of gravity and rotation pushes the material outward, making the planet bulge at the equator. They low-key want to become disks again. However, gravity doesn't want any lumpy planets. It wants them to be nice and round, so it keeps pulling on the material, trying to make everything as compact as possible. Eventually, gravity wins, and the planet settles into a spherical shape. Let's take some examples from our planetary playlist. Jupiter, the giant of the solar system, loves to show off its ablateness. It spins so fast that it becomes noticeably squished at the poles and chubby in the middle. It's like a spinning top with a cute belly. Saturn, the ringed wonder, also joins the oblate party. It spins around with its beautiful rings, and its ablateness is even more pronounced than Jupiter's. 
These examples show how rotation can give planets a unique shape. They go from being perfectly round to having a delightful bulge around the middle. It's like cosmic pottery, where the spinning motion creates a playful and distinct shape. So now you know why the planets are round. But what's more interesting is, what if they weren't? What if they were, let's say, cubical or even triangular? Well, let's see. A cube-shaped or a triangle-shaped planet would have its mass spread out in a completely different way than a sphere. And you know what that means? Gravity would be all shook up too. On a spherical planet, gravity pulls everything towards the center because the mass is evenly distributed around that center. But when we introduce a cube-shaped or triangle-shaped planet, things get interesting. If you're standing at the center of one of those faces, you'd feel the strongest pull of gravity. That's because the faces are the closest to the center of gravity. And as you venture away from the center and start walking towards the edges, gravity starts playing tricks on you. You would feel the struggle against the steep angled gravity. Walking on those edges would feel just like climbing a mountain or walking on a super steep slope. All because gravity wants you right in the middle of the face and nowhere else. Now imagine the terrain along the edges and corners. It's a barren, rocky, and dry landscape. Why? Well, all the water would pool in at the center of each face, leaving the edges high and dry. And the air quality? Well, it's either non-existent or so thin that it can't support life. Not the coziest place to set up camp, that's for sure. And don't forget your warm clothes, lunch, and hiking boots. You'll need them because of the crazy climate. The type of climate you'll encounter on our cube or triangle-shaped Earth depends on how it spins. If it rotates at its corners, each side would enjoy a mild, temperate climate. However, if it rotates on an axis through two of its faces, things get intense. Picture a roller coaster version of our current climate. Some faces would be polar wonderlands, icy and chilly. The top and bottom faces for the cube, and the bottom face for the triangle. Meanwhile, the other sides would be completely different. In a cube, they would be scorching hot with an equatorial climate that would make you break a sweat. Instead of sunlight gently curving along the surface, it would directly beam onto these faces. Talk about feeling the heat. And on a triangular planet, the sunlight would strike the faces at an angle. This angled sunlight would create fascinating temperature variations across the planet. Imagine this. As you move from the base of the triangle towards the tip, the temperatures would gradually decrease. The base, where the sunlight hits most directly, would be the hottest region, just like the equatorial climate we're familiar with on our spherical Earth. But as you venture towards the tip, the angle of sunlight would be less direct, leading to cooler temperatures. But the base is still super cold and dark, since the sunlight doesn't directly reach it. So the triangle would be absolutely crazy in terms of temperature changes and climate zones. By the way, you know that cozy blanket of air we call the atmosphere? Well, on our angular Earth, things would get a little topsy-turvy. Gravity would be pulling stronger from the center of each face. The result? The atmosphere would go through some crazy changes. Picture this. At the center of each face, where gravity is strongest, the atmosphere would gather and thicken. It would be like a bustling city, full of air molecules. But as you venture towards the edges, things would start to thin out. The atmosphere would become scarce and very thin. So breathing along the edges would be quite a challenge, and the edges would be a tough neighborhood for life to thrive. Moreover, a thinner atmosphere means less protection from the sun's radiation and solar winds, so corners and edges would be extremely dangerous for humans. Of course, this is all just a playful exploration of what could be. Our Earth loves its spherical shape, and that's a good thing. But there's no harm in imagining wild and wonderful possibilities. So keep your imagination soaring and continue to marvel at the marvels of our amazing planet, however it may be shaped. Put on your shades because Mercury is a hot spot. From the surface of this planet, the sun looks three times bigger than it does from Earth, and the light is 11 times brighter. Mercury may spin slower than Earth, but it still knows how to have a good time. One day on this planet lasts a whopping 59 Earth days. But don't worry. A year on Mercury is only 88 Earth days long. So if you want to feel like a centenarian, just divide your age by not 0.25 or multiply it by 4. This way, you'll get your approximate Mercurian age. Easy peasy. And let's not forget about Mercury's funky orbit. For every two orbits around the Sun, it spins twice. 
That means each hemisphere gets a full year of daylight followed by a long night. Time zones would be a mess on this planet. So we'll just stick to GMT. Ugh, did anyone forget to take out the trash? Why does it smell of rotten eggs in here? Uh, sorry, it's because we're on Venus now, and these stinky clouds don't smell like roses. Any planet's day is basically just how long it takes for it to do a full spin on its axis. Well, Venus takes its sweet time with this, way slower than Earth, in fact. So a day on Venus lasts a whopping 243 Earth days, or almost 6,000 hours. Now here's where things get a bit tricky. Because Venus's day is so long, we actually use Earth's day as standard for keeping time on the planet. That means there's only one time zone for the whole planet. Seems convenient, huh? Venus's year is about 225 days. So if you were celebrating New Year's Eve on Earth in the year 2000, that would have been Venus's year 3251. So to keep track of time of Venus, we can use the local year made up of 225 Earth days, but every three years or so, there's an extra short year made up of only 224 days. Not that confusing. We have leap years on Earth too, but it works a bit differently. We've made it to planet Earth. Woohoo! How many time zones do we have on this big blue ball? Give me a drum roll. 24. And did you know that we can actually mess with time a little bit? Yup, in about 80 countries, mostly in Europe and North America, we have something called daylight saving time. It's where we move our clocks forward an hour during the summer so we can soak up all that sweet, sweet sunshine. But beware, each country has its own rules about DST. So make sure you don't get caught snoozing when you're supposed to be working. And get this, some regions even have time zones that differ from UTC by half or quarter hour increments. Can you imagine that the moon is getting its own time zone? The European Space Agency announced on Monday that it's time for the moon to have its own synchronized time zone. With more and more countries and private companies planning missions to our lunar neighbor, it's important that we all speak the same language when it comes to timekeeping. Right now, each mission carries Earth's coordinated universal time with it, which is fine when there are only a few missions happening at once. But with dozens of moon missions planned over the next few years, things are going to get tricky. We need a system in place to make sure everyone's on the same page, or we'll end up with different spacecraft out of sync with each other, and nobody wants that kind of chaos in space. Precise timekeeping is super important for communication and navigation, so we need to figure out a way to make sure everyone's on the same page. The ESA hasn't figured out exactly what form this new lunar time zone will take, but they're working on it. Should there be a single organization responsible for keeping lunar time? Or should we let the moon set its own time? And what about more granular time zones based on the sun's position? These are all important questions that need to be answered. When it comes to a day on Mars, it's not too different from a day on Earth. We're talking 24 hours, 39 minutes, and 35 seconds. A Martian year is 1.8 Earth years, which means the Earth year 2000 happened in Martian year 1063. Almost forgot. The Martian year has 668 local days. Phew! We sorted out the Martian calendar, but Mars will need local time zones. Because of its elongated orbit, the difference between summer and winter hours will be significant. Daylight saving time will be a thing on Mars. A year on Jupiter lasts almost 12 Earth years. Yeah, that's like a lifetime in dog years. But don't worry, they've got 12 seasons to keep things interesting each almost as long as an Earth year, but a day on Jupiter only lasts 9 hours and 55 minutes. Also, since Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface, the clouds move at different speeds, so two free-floating atmospheric stations could experience different days. Hey, if we lived on Jupiter, we'd be in bad need of some cool app tracking all those things. Anyway, if we ever terraform Jupiter's region, most of the population will still live on Jupiter's moons because the atmosphere is just too wild. And get this, the moon's revolution periods are connected, so we can use the same day counting system for all of them. On Io, we can have two standard Jovian days in one Earth day. How do we break that down? Well, we could have a minute of 53 seconds and an hour of 103 minutes. 
Or we could just stick with Earth's minute and hour and have a day that's 21 hours and 13 minutes long. How old are you? I'm 200 days old and you? Sounds odd to you, Earth dweller, but uh, dudes on Saturn count their age in days. A year on Saturn is crazy long, like more than 29 Earth years. Kiddos would only get a fraction of a year, while the oldest folks might get a whopping three years. So to keep track of time on Saturn, we could divide up a Saturnian year into 29 or 30 seasons. Oh, and fun fact, Saturn doesn't even have a solid surface, just rotating clouds that spin at different speeds. But we could still set up some cool research stations or helium extraction balloons to float around up there. One Uranian year lasts a whopping 84 Earth years. So, to make things easier, we'll stick to using Earth years for our calculations. And natural Uranian years can be used for special occasions, like reaching one Uranian year old. As Uranus doesn't have a solid surface, the rotation period is all over the place. Only science missions and helium mining companies are brave enough to venture into the atmosphere. And get this, each moon has its own day and date system. Pretty confusing. Most people won't ever celebrate one Neptunian year old. One year on Neptune is like that's way too long for us humans to stick around. But don't worry, we'll still bust out the confetti and party hats for special occasions like when it's been two whole years since the first spaceship hit up Neptune. As for the rest of the time, we'll just use Earth years for all our business needs. Pluto takes a whopping 240 Earth years to orbit the Sun which is way too long to use as a year in our everyday lives. A day on Pluto is almost like a week on Earth. So, to keep track of time, we're gonna divide that into six standard Plutonian days, three of light and three of dark. That means a standard day on Pluto will last slightly more than one Earth day. Now, because Pluto's axis is super tilted, using time zones would be pointless. So we'll just use one time zone for the whole system. Easy peasy. As for the standard Plutonian year, it'll be almost the same as the Earth year, about 343 days. But once in 10 years, we'll throw in an extra day just for kicks. That's all for now. See you on Pluto. You might think falling into a black hole is as easy as falling into a giant pit. But boy, is it a whole different ballgame. To actually fall into a black hole, you would need some incredible luck and a dash of wizardry. Moreover, if you were watching something fall into a black hole, you wouldn't even see it. Why? Well, let's try to understand the magic of physics. Falling into a black hole is really, really tricky. First of all, to even have a chance of doing this, you would need to aim perfectly and start your journey from very far away. It's like trying to hit a tiny target from a long distance. That's because black holes exist within galaxies, which are filled with other objects like stars, planets, and gas clouds. These objects have their own gravitational forces that can influence the path you need to take. It's like you have to carefully navigate through the room, avoiding bumping into others or getting pulled off course by their movements. In a similar way, when falling into a black hole, you need to navigate through the influences of other celestial objects. As you get closer, things get even more complicated. Making even the tiniest change in direction would require a tremendous amount of energy that you wouldn't be able to generate. It's like trying to steer a spaceship with no fuel left. This is because the black hole's gravitational pull is immensely strong. Once you pass the point called the event horizon, there's no coming back you wouldn't be able to control anything. Now, even if you somehow manage to get on the right path and avoid all the obstacles, there's still a dangerous situation waiting for you. The intense heat and energy around the black hole, called plasma, would fry you as you get closer. So, you would need some impossibly strong protection to get even close to it. But not only is it nearly impossible to fall into a black hole, it's also impossible to see someone falling in it. Why? Let's find out. Imagine you're standing far away from a black hole, watching something getting closer and closer to the event horizon. As this thing, let's say it's a spaceship, falls into the black hole, two very strange things start happening. First, the color of the spaceship will change. You see, the gravity near a black hole is incredibly strong. 
much stronger than anything we experience here on Earth. This intense gravity affects everything around it, including light. Now, light has this fascinating property where it carries energy. But when light gets close to a black hole, the powerful gravitational pull starts sapping away its energy, kind of like stealing it, making light weaker. And you know how when you look at a beautiful sunset, the sun appears to be this warm, reddish-orange color? Well, that's because when sunlight travels through our atmosphere, it scatters and loses some of its higher-energy bluish colors, leaving behind the redder ones. So when light loses energy, it tends to shift towards the red end of the color spectrum. The same thing happens near a black hole. The light from the spaceship loses energy due to the black hole's strong gravity. So the spaceship, which initially had its own color, starts looking redder and redder as it gets closer to the black hole. It's as if the black hole is casting its magical spell, changing the color of the spaceship itself. The second weird thing is related to time. According to a theory of general relativity, gravity can mess around with time itself. And it works in a very strange way, because none of you, not you, not people on board a spaceship, will feel this change. For you, an observer in this scenario, time is flowing just like it always does. You're just sitting there, sipping your space lemonade and watching the spaceship's journey. For people on a spaceship, things are the same. Their watch ticks away at a regular pace, and they go about their day as usual. But objectively, for you, it would be like watching a spaceship fall in slow motion. It will seem to you that it's been falling into a black hole for weeks or even years. You might turn 80 and the spaceship is still out there. Crazy, right? Now, if time slows down for the spaceship, it means the light it emits also slows down. So imagine someone on that spaceship flicking a flashlight on and off. But because time is moving so slowly, the light coming from the flashlight also moves in slow motion. It takes ages for each burst of light to reach your eyes. You'll be watching a spaceship as if you're watching a video in super slow motion. And when light takes longer to reach your eyes, it becomes weaker and dimmer, just like a fading star. So, as the spaceship gets closer and closer to the black hole's event horizon, not only does it start looking redder, but it also appears dimmer. So, it becomes harder and harder to see the spaceship as it gets closer to the black hole. It slowly fades away, like a disappearing act on the grandest stage of the universe. Pretty mind-boggling, isn't it? But that's all about you, the observer. And how are people on board doing? What do you actually experience when you fall into a black hole? As you get closer to the black hole, something really weird starts happening. The gravity near the black hole is so powerful that it stretches and warps everything around it. So the difference in gravitational pull between your head and feet becomes significant. This difference creates a tidal force, which stretches your body like a long, thin shape. It's a process that's scientifically called spaghettification. Essentially, you would be stretched into a human noodle. Being turned into spaghetti might sound fun for a pasta lover, but it's definitely not so great for an astronaut. Meanwhile, colors around you begin to warp and distort, creating a dazzling light show. It's like riding a roller coaster through a rainbow tunnel. Twists and turns, flashes and sparks. It's an exhilarating, mind-bending experience. And then, what happens to you depends on the type of black hole. First, we have classical black holes. These are black holes that exist forever. If you fall into this black hole, it would take an incredibly long time to reach the center. The center would keep getting closer and closer, but you would need an almost infinite amount of time to reach it. So it would feel like your journey would never end. And then, we have evaporating black holes. These black holes can evaporate over time due to a process called Hawking radiation. It's just like the ice cubes melting away. These black holes have a limited lifespan, and it's basically impossible to fall into one of them. As you approach the evaporating black hole, you find yourself hovering near its edge, the event horizon. It's like being stuck at the entrance of a super cool amusement park. But guess what? This amusement park is shrinking. The black hole is evaporating, 
And as it does, the event horizon gets smaller and smaller. So you stay right at the edge, tracking its every move, but you will forever stay in this event horizon without ever crossing it. But remember, once you pass the point of no return, there's no way back. You're on a one-way ticket to the mysterious heart of the black hole, the Singularity. At the Singularity, everything goes bonkers. Our current understanding of physics goes haywire, so it's a bit like entering a magic show. What happens once you reach the Singularity? Is there anything on the other side of a black hole? We have no idea. It's a big mystery for us, but maybe we'll figure this out someday. So my friend, it's best to admire black holes from a safe distance and let your imagination soar with the incredible wonders they hold. Just remember to keep your pasta on your plate and not near these cosmic spaghetti makers. Do you recognize this majestic world? The second largest planet from the sun? Check. A gas giant with a hazy yellow-brown appearance? Check. Seven huge, intimidating rings? Check. You're right, it can't be anything else but Saturn. And recently, the Hubble Space Telescope has made an astonishing discovery. Apparently, the planet's rings have been doing something to the planet for a long time. A new study has revealed that these iconic rings are heating Saturn's upper atmosphere. The coolest thing, though, is that researchers from NASA claim that it's something scientists have never observed anywhere else in our solar system. This secret has been hiding in plain view for 40 years. And only after using the observations of the planet received from the Hubble Space Telescope and retired Cassini probe and Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft did astronomers figure it out. This unexpected interaction of the gas giant with its rings could become a tool for predicting if planets in other star systems have magnificent Saturn-like ring systems as well. So. How did it become clear that the gas planet is being slowly cooked by its own rings? The telltale evidence is an excess amount of ultraviolet radiation. It can be seen as a spectral line of hot hydrogen in the atmosphere of the gas giant. There's a bump in radiation that can only mean that something is heating the upper atmosphere from the outside. It's still kinda unclear how this process is happening. But the most probable explanation is that icy ring particles rain down on Saturn and cause this heating. But it might also be the impact of tiny meteorites or the particles of solar wind. The heating could be caused by solar ultraviolet radiation or some electromagnetic forces that pick up electrically charged dust. When NASA's Cassini probe finished its mission and plunged into Saturn's atmosphere, it had enough time to measure the atmospheric components. And it turned out that many particles were indeed falling from its rings. But in any case, the heating process happens under the influence of the gravitational field of the gas giant. You see, astronomers do know about the slow disintegration of Saturn's rings, but figuring out how this process affects the planet? That's new. Now, do you remember NASA's Cassini spacecraft I mentioned before? For more than a decade, it was studying Saturn, sharing images of the gas giant and its icy moons. It took us to marvelous worlds where methane rivers ran into methane seas and jets of gas and ice were blasting material into space. Anyway, that very Cassini also studied Saturn's magnetosphere. The thing is, Forces acting deep inside the planet produce a ginormous magnetic bubble under the planet. And this bubble is called the magnetosphere. Unfortunately, astronomers still have very little information about this phenomenon on Saturn, since magnetic fields are invisible and are, of course, best studied from within. Imagine this. Million mile per hour flows of electrically charged particles from the sun, aka solar wind, are spreading through the solar system. Suddenly, something appears in their way. Oh, it's Saturn's magnetic field. It protects the planet, making solar particles back away. As a result, the sun's magnetic forces are raging outside Saturn's magnetosphere, while inside the gas giant's protective bubble, its own magnetic forces dominate. Our home planet also has a magnetic field, but it creates a much smaller magnetosphere. 
and still, it effectively protects us from the harmful particles coming from the Sun and from space. But even though Saturn is protected by its magnetosphere, the Sun still manages to mess with the planet. Energetic winds from our star sweep over the gas giant, causing massive auroras. But unlike auroras here, on Earth, Saturn's auroras can only be seen in ultraviolet light. In other words, they're invisible from Earth's surface. You can only see them if you travel to space. But apparently, there are different kinds of auroras on the gas giant. For example, one more type is triggered by the charged particles coming from volcanic eruptions on the planet's moons. And some of Saturn's auroras might be caused by powerful winds swirling in the planet's own atmosphere. These winds blow in the ionosphere, which is a region located beneath the magnetosphere. The same winds might be responsible for the variable rotation rate of the planet. This phenomenon makes it difficult for scientists to figure out how long one day on the ringed planet lasts. Speaking of winds, Saturn has a mysterious vortex swirling over the planet's south pole. The whole thing resembles an enormous hurricane-like storm on Earth, but its eye alone measures almost 2,500 miles across. For comparison, the eye of a typical terrestrial hurricane is a mere 2 to 3 miles wide. What confuses astronomers is that although the phenomenon looks like a hurricane, it doesn't behave like one. It's stationary and keeps spinning over the same area of the South Pole. And while polar vortices on Earth have cold cores, the one on Saturn is warm. And now, brace yourself for another surprise Saturn has prepared for us. In an image sent to Earth by the Hubble Space Telescope, one can notice a couple of dark, shadowy spots on the left side of the planet's rings. Those are informally called spokes, maybe because they resemble spokes on a bicycle. The shading and shape of spokes vary. They may seem dark or light, it depends on the angle and illumination. Sometimes they may even look like blobs rather than something with a classical radial spoke shape. They also don't last long. But the good news is more and more will start to appear the closer we are to May 6, 2025. That's when the autumnal equinox on Saturn will occur. Now on Earth, that's the moment when the Sun is exactly above the equator of the planet and day and night are of the same length. But on Earth, it's something a bit different. Like our planet, Saturn is tilted on its axis. That's why it has four seasons. But since the orbit of the gas giant is much larger, each of these seasons lasts about seven Earth years. An equinox occurs when Saturn's rings are tilted edge on to the Sun. But what causes the spokes? Astronomers think it might be the gas giant's magnetic field. When a planetary magnetic field interacts with the solar wind, it creates an electrically charged environment. As we already know, on Earth, this results in northern lights, also called aurora borealis. And if we speak about Saturn, the tiniest icy ring particles might get charged too. And it probably temporarily levitates these particles above the larger boulders in the rings. For the first time, the spokes in Saturn's rings were spotted by NASA's Voyager mission. It happened in the early 1980s. At that time, we didn't know that these spokes were a seasonal phenomenon. Voyager 2 just passed by the planet, after all, and then sped on. To figure out what these spokes were and how they functioned, astronomers needed a space telescope that could observe Saturn's rings from afar, like Hubble. The latest equinox on Saturn occurred in 2009. That's when the Cassini space probe was traveling around the gas giant. It sent many amazing images back to Earth. It managed to prove quite quickly that the spokes weren't caused by gravitational interactions with Saturn or the influence of the gas giant's moons or small moonlets, which make up the planet's rings. It was the year 2005 when Cassini confirmed that the spokes were related to Saturn's magnetic field. And even though that mission was finished in 2017, now, Hubble keeps its long-term monitoring of the changes on and around Saturn. Despite all the observations, astronomers still can't predict the beginning and duration of the spoke season. 
Luckily, Saturn's prominent rings are a perfect laboratory for studying this phenomenon. Because even though other gas giants in the solar system also have rings, those are not so visible. And scientists don't know whether spokes occur on those planets.